The animosity of a provoked shark is one of the most terrifying things a person can witness, let alone experience. Sharks have rows of razor-sharp teeth attached to a powerful jaw, capable of ripping a human head off in an instant. So the fear of the ocean that many people have is quite justified. The story we have for you today concerns Sam Mitchell, a tourist who found himself in the murky deep and in the face of death from which he didn't manage to escape. The story of his demise was told by his best friend Thomas as a first-hand witness. Thomas and Sam met in Oklahoma during a comedy show in 2000 and remained steadfast friends through shared interest and a love for ocean fishing. The pair went on many voyages to catch fish from the waterways of their hometown to the deep oceans around the United States. Sam's favorite fishing experience was fishing for Goliath groupers in the Florida Keys, as the sheer power of the beast was something that couldn't be described with words. They spent many holidays on family fishing trips, as Sam was Thomas's best man at his wedding. Sam was a solitary type, enjoying only the company of his dog and the occasional girlfriend. He always had his best friend, so the pair decided they would relive their Goliath grouper experience on the 10th anniversary of the day they met. They booked a trip to Florida in August of 2010 and arrived in the early hours of the morning. They specifically wanted to go to the Florida Keys again, so they set up their accommodation in the same place as before, since they knew the owner. The next day, they enjoyed the time they took off work to lounge around the beach all day stopping at the local sites and driving to Miami for some drinks. They didn't stay too long as they wanted an early start to the fishing, so they got back around 10 p.m. The following morning, the pair went out to rent a boat as well as some fishing equipment they would need for the day. Regulations were stricter at this point, so they had to have two boat instructors with them, despite their experience in both piloting a boat and fishing for Goliaths. The men that went with them were also seasoned fishermen, and despite their age, they were excellent, enjoyable company for Sam and Thomas. It took them about 30 minutes to reach the place where the groupers usually gathered, and it was a relaxing experience for the most part. Groupers are notoriously powerful fish, so fishermen need to use a 400-pound monofilament line to even attempt to pull them in. Luckily, Sam and Thomas's boat was equipped with everything they would need. The fish took a while to bite despite the fresh bait the two guys procured at the start of their journey, but one did eventually bite, and it nearly pulled Thomas into the ocean within a moment. It was a 600-pound Goliath grouper. Sam and one of the instructors rushed to help Thomas keep hold of the fish, and they just barely managed it. It took some while to tire the grouper out, but eventually floated up to the surface, and the group marveled at the sheer size of it. They freed the large hook from the fish's lip and pushed it a bit to get it to swim again. Harvesting or killing a grouper was only allowed during certain seasons, and often through a lottery draw for a single fish. But just the adrenaline of reeling in a behemoth like that was enough for any fisherman. The day went on and the group caught some smaller fish as well as the occasional grouper. But it started going wrong when Sam managed to hook one. His battle with the fish was cumbersome and difficult. But Sam managed to pull the fish up by himself as it wasn't as large as the previous fish they caught. As it floated on the surface, they noticed that the fish was tangled in a mess of netting and their line inhibiting its movement. Sam reached for his cutters and went to cut the netting from the fish before removing the hook, but it was tightly wrapped around the fish's tail and back fins. He pulled at it to gain some slack, but to no avail. The fish was bleeding and clearly in pain, so Sam set to work on cutting the netting away. As he was making progress, the fish recovered from the fatigue and started thrashing in the water, getting Sam's hand caught in the netting and pulling him overboard. He fell behind the fish, and only his arm was visible across the top of it. But the group's panic subsided when they saw Sam, smiling and saying he was okay. He still had his cutters and managed to free his hand and the few remaining strands of netting before Thomas pulled the hook from its mouth and it was on its way. 
Sam checked the netting of the boat so it could be repurposed or thrown away safely. And he kept treading water as Thomas called him a crazy bastard for doing what he did. Sam waved him off and remarked how he wouldn't forget that one. He was still smiling at what had happened, but Thomas realized that something was wrong. His blood turned to ice as he saw the surface of the water distort and splash, which Sam didn't notice. A giant red maw erupted from the water and engulfed Sam's head, pulling him under the water within a second. That single second seemed to span a lifetime as Thomas saw his best friend's life end in front of him. Thomas and the instructors yelled in surprise and stared in shock as they processed what they had just seen. They ran to the railing and looked to see where Sam was, but all they saw was his body floating just below the surface. They later confirmed that a great white shark had most likely smelled the chum and bait used to lure the groupers to the boat and took its chance with Sam. Thomas immediately leaped into the water and grabbed Sam's body, helping the others haul it up into the boat. The shark was nowhere to be seen. He fell to the floor as the reality of the situation crashed down on him, and he began sobbing uncontrollably. One of the fishermen pulled Thomas to the side and shielded him from the side of Sam's body, while the other wrapped the body in a spare tarp to preserve his dignity. The trip back to shore was silent and dreadful, with Thomas falling into fits and panic attacks over the incident. The floor and sides of the boat were covered in blood from both the fish and Sam's body. Emergency services were called, which took Sam's body to wait for his family to arrive. By that time, a curious crowd of people gathered to see what had happened. Some of them were silent and respectful, while others whispered among themselves. Sam had his mother and father, as well as a younger sister. It took them five hours to arrive on account of the flight, but Thomas was glad to see them, as he had had time to calm down and get a change of clothes. They went to the morgue and Sam's mother demanded to see her son, disregarding Thomas's warnings about his body. She got the chance to see it, and she screamed in anguish at the sight. She blamed Thomas for the incident, despite it not being his fault, which he didn't take to heart as he understood how she felt. Sam's mother was in hysterics, so he left the hospital's morgue to allow the family to grieve on their own. The walk back to the room was solemn, and Thomas kept repeating what had happened in his head multiple times. He couldn't accept that his best friend was dead, and the night he spent alone in the room was haunting. He somehow got through the night and boarded a plane back to Oklahoma the next day, phoning his wife and telling her about the incident in the process. She was supportive and came to pick him up at the airport. He wasn't the same for many months after the incident, developing severe depression and anxiety that made day-to-day -day life debilitating without medication. He eventually moved past the incident and even got back in touch with Sam's family to provide mutual support. Although the great white shark is often considered the most dangerous species of shark in the world, this is a misconception. While they are the most powerful species of shark, bull sharks are actually more dangerous as they are far more aggressive and more likely to attack humans when interacting with them. They have the tendency to stick to shallow coastal waters and can sometimes migrate up rivers when looking for new places to feed in. Bull sharks can be found all around the world, but the case that we're bringing to you today was noted in Sierra Leone, where Michelle Jones, a tourist, would learn the full potency of nature. Michelle was from North Carolina and had a job as a teacher. She lived in the same town all of her life and always wanted to travel the world. But the tight budget of a school teacher in the United States prevented that. Her husband, Roger, was a blue collar worker and rarely had enough time for leisure. The pair lived their lives for many years before Michelle's husband announced that they were taking a trip. She was surprised and Roger explained that he had won a bonus at his job and they could use some of their savings to essentially go wherever they wanted to. 
Michelle was overjoyed by the news, and it took them a few days to agree on where they wanted to go. After some back and forth, they compromised on Sierra Leone, as they had heard amazing things about it. Sierra Leone had fantastic sights, and its beaches were ideal for tourists to lounge and relax from the stress of life. Their trip was booked in no time, and they had two weeks of relaxation ahead of them. They arrived in Sierra Leone on July 17, 1998, after a long flight with a few layovers. So they were quite exhausted and decided just to head to their accommodation and call it a day. The next few days were spent seeing the sights of the city, visiting museums, having drinks, and just enjoying everything the city had to offer. Near the end of the first week, the pair decided they would enjoy some time at the beach. After a day spent lounging around, they went back to their hotel and spotted a sign advertising a cruise from Freetown to Tenafor, which would last for the entire day. Since they were the type to jump at the chance for new experiences, they decided to go on the cruise. Two days later, the cruise was set to start at 9 a.m., so Michelle and Roger got there 30 minutes early. There were 10 more people aside from them, and the tour guide was in high spirits and quite friendly, so the mood was good. They had never been on a cruise before, so they were excited for the day to come. The cruise took two hours to reach its initial destination, after which they would have some time to enjoy the sights and whatever they wanted to do. Then they had the trip back. The trip to Tenafor was relaxing and enjoyable as the weather was on their side, and the guide's stories about Sierra Leone was quite enjoyable. Michelle and Roger spent their free time in Tenafor, very similarly to their first few days in Freetown, so it was quite enjoyable. The trip back to Freetown was much the same, but something that made the boat slow down was a small shiver of sharks accumulating around a single point in the water, something you wouldn't see too often. The guide asked the pilot of the boat to slow down so everyone could get a better look. Upon closer inspection, they saw that there were three sharks feeding on something in the water, and they couldn't identify it on account of all the blood in the water. The tourists gathered on the boat's railing to see the shark, as the guide described it as a must-see event. They pressed on the railing, struggling to see over each other to take in as much of the scene as possible. Michelle and Roger were side by side and talking about how interesting the scene was. The sharks were ravenous and zipping through the water, absolutely tearing at whatever was in the water. At the peak of the feeding frenzy, the guide said that the boat would start up at that point to stay on schedule. The boat was turned on and started slowly moving forward, and the guide continued to explain what they would do upon returning to Freetown. However, the guide's words were drowned out of Michelle's ears as she hyper-focused on the squeaky railing getting progressively louder. It gave way. Within a moment, Michelle found herself splashing in the water in the middle of the shiver of sharks. The rest of the people on the boat barely managed to hold on to each other to not follow Michelle. Roger screamed after his wife and made an attempt to jump in after her, but the guide prevented him from doing that since the shark would attack him as well and they would have to save both of them. The moment she fell into the water, Michelle immediately felt the harsh, coarse skin of one of the sharks shred the skin on her back, making her yelp in pain. She flailed her arms in panic as she tried to get to the surface more securely. Normally, Michelle might have had a chance to swim to safety if it was a different shark species in the water with her. But these were bull sharks, and they were hungry. Just as Michelle made eye contact with Roger, she felt a searing pain in her lower thigh, which made her shriek and fall below the surface again. The shark took the move to take the first bite and was quickly out of the way to make way for the next mouth. The guide and the boat's pilot were trying to get the boat closer to Michelle, but it had already moved at least a dozen yards away. Roger was screaming at them to get the boat closer so he could pull his wife to safety but it wasn't working out at all. Michelle felt another set of teeth clamp down on her ankle, pulling her under the water as a strong force knocked into her ribs, disorienting her. All at once, she felt a tremendous amount of pain as the third shark took hold of her right arm, tearing into it 
and releasing a red mist in the water around her. The pain was more than too much, so after expressing one final scream with the last of her breath, her consciousness started to fade. The last thing she remembered before waking up in the hospital was her husband's hands clutching her arms and pulling her up from the aquatic hell. According to Roger, Michelle was losing a large amount of blood, so the boat was rushing across the water as fast as it could, while the rest of the people on the boat helped tend to Michelle. The only reason Michelle is alive today is that among the group of tourists, there was a single nurse and the boat had a first aid kit and its essential equipment. Her wounds were bound and tourniquets were applied, but it wasn't much in the way of helping her survive for sure. Emergency services were called to the port where the boat was supposed to dock and two paramedics were ready by the time they got there. She was quickly taken to an ambulance followed by her husband. After she was admitted to the emergency room, the doctors informed Roger that Michelle had lost nearly 35% of her blood, which was near the lethal point, but she would survive. It took a few days for her to stabilize before she could be seen, so Roger was more than relieved when he saw his wife was okay. Her injuries were debilitating as there was some nerve damage and loss of function so she needed a good deal of physical therapy to be able to walk and use her arm properly. That took months, but she did pull through and was back to teaching after a few months of recovery. She said that what happened in Sierra Leone was tragic, but it was the way nature worked. She fell into the shark's plate and they responded instinctively. She mentioned multiple times how much she appreciated her husband and the effort he put in to help her that day.